for that to happen. This is a test. What is it going to take? Get out the vote. Get out the vote. Because when Democrats vote, Democrats win. We did this a recitation. When Democrats vote, Democrats win. You can do better than that. When Democrats vote, Democrats, Democrats win. win. All right. All right. So without any further ado, let me introduce the next congressman from New York 21, Matt Castelli. Hello, Washington County. Woo! Thank you, Alan. Um, as Alan noted, I am Matt Castelli, and I'm running for Congress. The only two pieces of information you really need to walk out of here with tonight and retain uh, for the next five weeks, five weeks from today is election day. So the, our time frame's getting close here and we're certainly uh, racing all over the place. And one of the things that we're doing here tonight is something that we're doing in all 15 counties of New York 21. Yes, New York 21 used to be 12 counties. Now it's 15, it got bigger. It's a lot of terrain. It's about a third of New York state. And it's our goal and objective to be everywhere. Uh, and to be out in the community engaging with folks as we have from the start of our campaign, which was about a year or so ago. And we're doing a town hall in every single county because that's what representation should be. It should be showing up in the community, listening to the concerns of, of voters, hearing about their challenges, the, their hopes, the issues that are top of mind for them, and offering some input, hopefully, on those issues. Now, I'll have to provide an important caveat. I am not yet a member of Congress. And so when we talk about things tonight, I won't have uh, a particular insight for what's going on in Washington, uh, a particular piece of legislation I'm working on to address your issues, at least not yet. But as you elevate uh, those issues or challenges or concerns you have, let's talk about it. And I'll offer my input and perspective. There may be some instances where I don't have an answer to your, for your question, and I'm gonna acknowledge that, and then I'm gonna go work to go get an answer for that. But what I'll start off by doing is uh, maybe describing a little bit of who I am and why I'm running, because maybe not everyone's had the opportunity to, to learn a little bit about that. And then we'll get into some questions. I will also preserve about 10 minutes or so at the end. So if you feel as if you maybe don't want to raise your hand in front of a large group and raise an issue, come meet me one-on-one -on -one and we can talk about things in that way, okay? So I'm Matt Castelli running for Congress. I was uh, born and raised in the Hudson Valley, a little bit further south than here, and I went to Siena College, not too far from here. I was born in a bipartisan household. Dad's the Democrat, mom's the Republican. And so maybe it's not too much of a surprise to learn that I was actually an independent for much of my life. <laughs> my last name, Castelli, means castle. And when my growing up formative years, we didn't talk about politics in our household. It wasn't a matter of division, the Republican versus the Democrat. It was about shared values. And so this name Castelli means castle in Italian. It's really about providing a sense of safety, security, and strength. Um, that's something, a shared value that I think I grew up with and one that I think shaped my sort of upbringing and, and what I would do with my life. So at Siena College, 21 years ago, 9-11 happened. Uh, became a driving force for my career. So I went and I joined the CIA. I spent about 15 years there doing counterterrorism work after 9-11. I led teams hunting down some of the world's most dangerous terrorists. I worked in the same department that found Osama bin Laden. That's the kind of work that I did against comparable level bad guys. I served in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and had enough success doing all of that that I was tapped by the Obama White House to come down and serve as the director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council a role I was asked by the Trump administration to stay on it, and I did, for the first year of the Trump White House. Because if I learned anything throughout my career of public service, it's this, that when it comes to protecting our country, our communities, my family, yours, it requires us to put country before party, and my belief in that has never wavered. Now I went back to CIA to do some work there for about two more years with cutting edge technology startups, got a business degree out at Northwestern, and then COVID hit. Now, where I came from in the Hudson Valley, it's not too far away from West Point. My grandfather was an army doctor at West Point. He got out of the army, he remained a physician, and then he raised a family of nurses. Almost everyone in my family is a nurse, with the exception of my mother. She served in a different way. She became a teacher. But my grandpa instilled within our family a sense of duty, 
a duty to care. And so when COVID hit, and we got to a point pretty quickly in the pandemic where we were having a 9-11 every single day in this country, it was the most compelling challenge of our time. It's still an ongoing issue that we're dealing with. Uh, so I decided to leave government after about 15 years, and I joined a healthcare organization here in New York, started by veterans to better coordinate care for veterans, rural communities, by connecting health and social care together. A real focus on our human and social service providers, because that's where health and well-being happens in our communities. I was building out coordinated care networks throughout the Northeast, loved what I was doing. And then January 6th happened. You might imagine a former counterterrorism guy like myself, who spent a career trying to prevent things like that from happening in foreign capitals, to see it happen in our own didn't sit well with me. But certainly what didn't sit well with me was the response we saw from Congresswoman Stefani. It's her lies that led to the events of that day. She's certainly continuing to embrace those lies. Uh, she's defending the actions of a violent insurrection to overthrow the will of the people. I think she violated her oath to the Constitution, the same oath that I took when I joined the CIA many years ago. And so in watching her sell out our country and our democracy, we decided to launch this campaign to run against her. But as we know, that was not just an isolated incident of Congresswoman Stefanik selling out our country and our community. She's consistently sold us out in order to advance her own career and her own interests and our corporate donors. She certainly sold out veterans and women and seniors and the list goes on and on. We'll probably have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. And as I drive throughout our district, yes, I'm galvanized by the strong support that we've got from Democrats all across these 15 counties, but that's not it. Because folks understand across the political spectrum that Congresswoman Stefanik has sold us out over the last eight years she's been in office. And they're looking for a moderate. <coughs> someone that can bring us together and start solving some problems. Not creating more problems, but actually just solving them, bringing us together to do so. And so some of the things we're focused on in this campaign as a result of the conversations that I've had from folks, you know, I'm gonna fight to reduce costs for working families and make sure that we've got a strong economy that works for everybody. I'm gonna fight to defend our freedoms. Most certainly a woman's right to control her own body and make her own healthcare decisions. and the Second Amendment. And we're gonna to fight to make sure that we've all got safety and security. And so yes, that's gonna come from funding our law enforcement, securing our borders, but it's also gonna come from fighting to protect our democracy. And it's also gonna come from the kind of security that comes from knowing we're taking care of our seniors and our veterans and providing healthcare in our communities and ensuring we've got economic security. There are different kinds of security and we need people focused on providing that as well. So there's a long list of things that we can and should do, but why don't we respond to some of those with the questions that you may have an opportunity to ask right now. And so what we'll do is we'll open up the floor, just raise your hand and uh, we can kick this off. Sure. The average age of this crowd is not 21. <laughs> and I'm concerned about young voters. How are you going to draw them in? And about people registering to vote. I remember when Nelson Mandela got out of prison, ran for president of South Africa, people stood in line for days to vote for him. And we can't get people to the polls. How much emphasis are you putting on that? And are you reaching out to young voters? So the, can everyone, did everyone hear the question? I could repeat it. It's about really engaging with young voters, registering new voters, and making sure that we're galvanizing uh, a contingent of uh, the youth vote that may not be as robustly reflected here today. Um, <laughs> we are certainly doing that. Um, one of the things that we'll note in this campaign is that we do have uh, a, a strong amount of outreach from our campaign with others reaching out to college students. We've got a lot of uh, colleges and universities throughout the district. We're engaging those. Our demographics as a district does tend to be a little bit older, but we're, we're not resting on that. We're certainly engaging with folks directly. Uh, we're reaching out on social media. Uh, I do have a robust Instagram presence. Some of you may note that I've uh, been eating probably one too many burgers. Um, and there are some times where I go to a place like the Whipple City Festival, and I've got some young folks who are like, hey, that's that burger guy. Um, which is fine, happy to have the face and the recognition that they know me from somewhere. 
Um, but we're gonna keep doing things like that and directly engaging. Now we've got until the 14th of October uh, for getting people registered and engaging with them. There's gonna be a lot of work actually happening this upcoming weekend. As you may know, this is gonna be, uh, I think a weekend or at least a day of action in support of not just in advance of the election in November, but tied to uh, protests with the overturning of Roe and Dobbs. So you'll find me most certainly not too far away in Glens Falls. There's gonna be major events happening there. And it's gonna be a big event to try to get additional folks um, registered to vote. The unfortunate reality of the Dobbs decision is that we are now required certainly to take action. And I will say that at the various protests rallies that I've been to on that issue across the district, it has been encouraging to see young people engaged. And not just young women, young men as well. And so they're engaged on the issue. Uh, one of the things that I think is also kind of appealing, I hope, is that this age group of, I think, about 18 to 25, maybe even 29, that you see as a large voting block, they're less likely to be a, a affiliated with a political party because they don't feel particularly well served by either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And so when I talk to them about putting country before party and actually doing some problem solving and start talking about the issues that matter most to them, that's a way that we can break through, not necessarily being a, a true dyed in the wool party loyalist that's only gonna represent party interests. And so we're doing as much as we can and engaging at every level, but that's also a requirement, maybe an ask that I'll put to all of you. If there are young people in your lives, uh, if there are folks in your community, uh, the requirement now for this election over the course of the next five weeks is to engage with as many folks as possible across the age spectrum, across the political spectrum. We're doing phone banking, we're doing door knocking, and we're gonna engage with folks at every, every turn. You mentioned uh, border security when you were speaking. Do you wanna tell us where you are with that? Sure, so the question's about border security, and just sort of my position on this. And I might take a stance that's a little different from other Democrats you may have heard from. I think the border's in trouble. I think you can't watch these images on your television screen and not have a sense of concern about what's happening down there. Why isn't the border secure? Why do we have so many engagements? Now, I lay blame on the leadership of both political parties over the last couple of decades. I don't think anybody's been serious about addressing this issue. I think we've seen leadership from both political parties use border security and comprehensive immigration reform as a weapon for political purposes, and neither have been able to move uh, those initiatives forward. And so from my perspective, listen, I'm a national security, or at least a former national security guy. Um, having a secure border is critical to our national security. It's critical to our sovereignty. And the American people need to have a sense of confidence that our border is secure. So I think that there's a requirement now to go ahead and secure the darn border. But, I don't trust the politicians in Washington to do it. I don't trust them to actually give us an honest assessment of what's secure and what's not. You know, every single election we have, I'm sure it's just a matter of time where we're gonna see images on our television screen about a new migrant caravan that's on its way because they use these things as wedges to sort of fire people up and get them upset. I think we should take it out of Congress's hands and put it into an independent bipartisan commission that can evaluate the true security of the border identify where there are gaps, and provide recommendations about how to close those gaps so that the American people can have actual confidence in the recommendations that are gonna be put forward and then acted upon. Then, and only then, can we actually pursue comprehensive immigration reform, because that's something we need too. We can't continue to grow, we can't grow our economy without more people here. And as somebody who is the grandson of Italian immigrants, my grandmother came from Sicily into Ellis Island, her name's on the wall there, we need to have secure, confident, humane, uh, streamlined processes by which people can come to the greatest nation of the world in the world. Because that's... Because listen, people are always gonna wanna come here. We are the greatest nation in the world. They're gonna come here for a variety of reasons, economic opportunity. We've got wonderful, wide open, beautiful spaces to, to enjoy. People are coming as a result of climate migration and challenges in the Southern Hemisphere. It's not a question of policies about what's open and what's not. It's a, always gonna be an issue of people wanna come to the United States of America. We should tell them how to come here legally. And the best way to do that is by having a clearly defined process and a secure border. So I'm gonna cut through the noise, I'm gonna cut through the partisanship, and we're gonna go get it done. Much of the border security is pushed rather than pulled, meaning people fleeing 
uh, economic problems, uh, personal security problems, and would we be better off doing something to try and help out those places that people are fleeing from? Yeah. It's a good question. It's, it's ultimately his question is around where people are fleeing, whether it's the Southern Hemisphere or elsewhere, um, is it addressing the root cause of the challenges there that are causing them to leave? I think that there's probably a little bit of work to be done there, but at the end of the day, our primary responsibility is to make sure that we can protect our own borders and our own sovereignty and give people a, a pathway. There are some things that we always should be doing in trying to reduce, in particularly, you know, advancing democracy and, you know, uh, pursuing um, our ideals across the world, humanitarian basis and humanitarian aid, uh, boosting uh, economic, mutually beneficial economic positions that we could do there. The climate is a key challenge. You know, some of the places in the Southern Hemisphere are becoming uninhabitable. And so we're gonna have to address those issues, not just for the Southern Hemisphere, but for the rest of us as well. And so there are things that we need to do that will have cascading effects in that region. But I think our primary focus and attention has to be sort of the securing things here at home. Um, this is a question about Social Security. One of the, um, besides voting against reasonable, you know, and trying to get rid of it, you know, we all read the, the, the actuarial tables of, you know, if it's not refunded, um, if additional funds don't come in by, you know, 2035, it's going to be, you know, 80% rather than. And I, I suspect a lot of people in this room are like me. We're not impoverished, but we do depend on our Social Security. There have been various suggestions about how to fund it, including, I think the top income bracket is 100,000 or 150, 10 or something. How, how would you address that? Because it, it seems to me that's a critical, it's critical and it's something that the Republicans have actually demonstrably sort of undermined. Yep. Um, and it's one of the social programs like Medicare uh, that's absolutely critical, not just to this <coughs> demographic, but to other, you know, yep. the future demographics. Too. Right. Uh, I'm paying into a system, or at least, I mean, when I was earning an income. Right now, I'm technically just a volunteer for this campaign. <laughs> um, but I have paid into a system, and those are earned benefits, right. not just for me, but for everyone else here, right? You paid into a system that you expect to be there for you when you retire, when you need it. My parents are both seniors. They both are on Social Security and Medicare. And so this is a personal issue to me. I want to make sure that their entitlements that they have earned are available to them. And I have to say, I don't trust my parents' Social Security and Medicare. I don't trust Elise Stefanik with my parents' Social Security and Medicare. I don't trust your Social Security and Medicare with Elise Stefanik, right? Um, because in no small part, yes, you see these proposals being discussed by some of our allies, like Rick Scott, who want to subset these programs in five years. Um, Stefanik was the architect about gutting both programs a couple years back. Um, so this is a real issue, and there's been no, I think, offering of solutions on the other side. There are also some real concerns that I have about just fiscal responsibility overall. We can't keep spending as a nation as much as we are and taking on as much debt as we are because over time, the interest on that debt that we're gonna to have to pay out will impact these programs. But we've reduced the deficit. We certainly have. We've done so in this you know, past year and a half or so, but there's a lot there and it continues to grow and there's work to be done there. But you offer a, a, a point and then I'll, I'll comment on um, you know, solvency for social security. You know, how do we make sure that we're protecting the benefits that we currently have, if not adding to them? And the only way to do that is with additional sort of resources. And so antiquated formulas that have, you know, a cap on uh, tax income at whatever it might be, 100, 125,000 or whatever it may be, that seems like a, a solution worth exploring is how do we increase that cap? That right now, you know, that was probably set at a period of time where that was maybe a very high earner. That might now be a little bit more of a middle income uh, earner. And so how do we make sure that everybody's paying their fair share into a certain system and that those wages we're actually paying into the system for them as well, you know, it's an earned benefit. And so I think that there's an opportunity there to, to look at the over, uh, the, the over the horizon long-term solvency, certainly of Social Security and Medicare, but that's something we're always gonna fight to protect are those benefits, if not adding to them. 
as a teacher who, uh, with my students, uh, saw the World Trade Center come down um, looking over Lower Manhattan uh, and going into our funerals. I just want to thank you very much for your service, that you made that uh, decision to devote a large portion of your life to uh, protecting our country from terrorism, and it's real. Um, I just really want to thank you for that. And um, we just had another 9-11. I mean, what happened in uh, Fort Myers in Florida is another a mass casualty, huge economic impact, the whole city gone. How do you plan to, or I'm assuming, <laughs> promote in environmental policies, convincing how people here may think they're immune to that because we're not on the coast. I mean, we all know Irene packed the wall. You know, so we're not immune. We're not immune to drought, so I mean, obviously, it's 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 a, it's a pile of money, you know, is going to be going into recovery, and it's going to be here, and it's going to be there, and it's going to be here. So, how do you plan to address it? And I have one other question, which is it since you're absolutely platonic for a, a debate. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question first? Yes. I'll get to both of those. Uh, how many? How long did you teach for? Uh, Twenty-seven years. Thank you for your service. <laughs> So on the, the latter point about debates, we've agreed to four, she's agreed to none. A deadline has come and gone by which for her to provide input so that they could schedule these things. So as it stands right now, there will be no debates, um, which is really, you know, yes, I'd love the opportunity to debate, but you deserve to hear from her. You deserve to hold her accountable and answer for her record of failure. Um, not to be pejorative and <laughs> assign it, but you know, how often has she done a town hall in Washington County? Um, years. We know that she doesn't show up and talk directly with voters and constituents. She, we know that she doesn't talk with the press. We know that she doesn't now want to debate. And so she's pulled up behind high walls in Washington, D.C., uh, focused on her career. And as it stands right now, we may not have an opportunity to, to have a debate and an airing of the different kinds of ideas that she has potentially for at least her career, I've got some ideas for our future. And we should have a representative that's in, invested and focused on that. We're gonna to continue to try to seek other opportunities to make sure we're engaging um, with the media to get our message out there, but we'll enlist the support of all of you all to continue to promote that. On your first question about the devastation that's now just occurred in Florida, and uh, what we've seen far too often now, these extreme weather events that wreak tremendous havoc was looking at the numbers just from last year and it was a record year where we spent 150 billion dollars on disaster recovery um, you know we, we've always had hurricanes on the east coast and they're getting more and more aggressive and seeking you know terrible devastation the west coast is on fire and it's drying up um, we can't afford not to address climate change. If you look at those costs, you can't say that it's not worth our investment to take on the long-term challenges of addressing these extreme weather patterns and events through addressing climate change. But in addition to that, there's a lot of opportunity for us. Certainly we want to protect our local economy from adverse weather conditions <clears throat> because it may not take an Irene to have an impact on our tourism industry in the Adirondacks. You know, whether it's our ski slopes and protecting the length of snowpack that we've got there and the tourism dollar that's associated with bringing people in there, or it's protecting our farmers to make sure that they're not gonna have a, a heavy wet season that's gonna wipe out a crop for a particular season and leave a small family farm devastated. Our economy on a local level can't afford to not address this. But we also have a tremendous opportunity because this is the economic opportunity of this century to make the kinds of investments in green technology um, that would be useful, not just for combating climate change, but to tap into the wonderful and abundant natural resources that we've got throughout much of Northern New York. Wide open spaces, some wind, we've got hydro uh, places that we could be you know, pursuing for hydro energy. And so there are tremendous job opportunities, economic growth. We can be the engine of the green economy, not just for New York State, but maybe even the Northeast. But I'll also caveat, if we're gonna be generating a lot of power we should benefit from that. Our, if it's gonna be coming from our local economy, we should be uh, 
disproportionately advantaged from the cost savings in our own power, our own energy, our own electricity. Um, in some instances, when you set those up, we don't want to make sure, we don't want to see a scenario where New York City is somehow benefiting from our hard work in our backyard. So we want, they can, but we want to make sure that we benefit from it uh, more so. So there's a lot there, but there are tremendous opportunities that we can't avoid not to take advantage of. In your opening remarks, you commented about safeguarding the Second Amendment. Could you elaborate a little bit about what you uh, prepared to support amid all the gun violence that pervades every day? Yeah. So the question is really around uh, gun safety, gun responsibility, uh, amid the challenges we now have with rising gun violence. And that's the, the key point there is a recognition that we are at a moment where there's an epidemic of gun violence. The statistics are terrible. Gun violence is the number one cause of death of our children in this country right now. That's a real problem. And it's one that requires us all to engage and take action. I can be a gun owner, which I am, a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, which I am, and also seek some sort of safety and uh, care for our kids and our communities from rising rates of gun violence. And I think that there is a consensus and a coalition that can be built and has maybe already been built, particularly in, the, in recent months after these terrible events down in Uvalde, Texas, and you know, massacres in, in schools, that those of us can come together and focus on common sense solutions around keeping any firearm out of the hands of someone that's gonna do themselves or others harm. That's around common sense universal background checks or making sure our law enforcement have the tools that if someone is an identified threat in their community that they don't have the weaponry to actually present such a harm in their community. Those are the kinds of things that we can all agree on and you'll find a lot of agreement among those of us who are gun owners and strong supporters of the Second Amendment. That sounds reasonable because guess what? I don't want cop killers to have the weapons to do harm. I don't want kid killers to have the weapons to do harm. But the challenge here from my opponent is that she has not offered any reasonable solution to reduce gun violence. And unfortunately, she's married to a member of the gun lobby. And she's working overtime to make sure that every cop killer, kid killer, domestic abuser, terrorist has unfettered access to whatever weapon they choose. And so that's a real challenge and a real difference in, I think, this race about actually advancing our safety and security in our communities while respecting the rights of law-abiding gun owners. It can be done. It's done in our community all the time. I think New York 21 is actually a shining example of gun safety and gun responsibility that others should be looking to about how to do this. And so I think having a representative that would uphold that and acknowledge at least that we do have a crime issue. We've got uh, a gun epidemic in terms of the deaths and the violence that we see and that there are steps that can be taken to make sure our law enforcement aren't being outgunned when they show up to the scene of a crime. What about assault rifles? The question's about assault rifles and assault weapons. Now, I do not support a ban on assault weapons. The reason is that in order to address this moment of urgency, we need everyone on board. When people raise the term assault weapon or assault rifle, People hear different things. And a lot of folks who are law-abiding gun owners hear they're gonna take my guns away. And then they break apart from the coalition. It's no surprise that you'll see folks on the far right start using that as a threat and a wedge to try to break apart this coalition that we have right now. And so I don't support an assault weapons ban because I don't think it's well-defined. And I don't think it meets the moment that we have right now that requires us to actually reduce the rate of gun violence in our communities. I think it's actually counterproductive. And so I don't support an assault weapons ban. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about campaign advertising. And I don't mean advertising in general. I mean, what is like the focus of your campaign? How are you getting people to vote for you? And then on the flip side, what are you doing about um, so the question is, what are we doing to get the word out uh, to inform voters? And when he's presuming something that the other side may lie in this race, um, <laughs> they may lie about me in this race. And what are we going to do in response to that? 
So on, on the first front, we're certainly gonna take advantage of every opportunity. Right now, today, we launched our first TV ad of the general election. Uh, you should see that on broadcast and cable uh, throughout the course of today and the next couple of weeks. And we're gonna keep communicating with that. We're not relying on that. We certainly do social media engagement, but we're also doing mailers and the opportunity to actually beyond the paid advertisements to leverage the support that we've got from a tremendous number of volunteers. And here I'm gonna put a plug in. If you're not already signed up to volunteer for this campaign, knocking on doors, calling uh, through our phone banking is a tremendous opportunity for us to engage with voters, to persuade them to not just show up and vote, but to vote for Castelli in this race. Uh, so go to our website, castelliforcongress.com. There's a volunteer tab, sign up there. So we're gonna be doing all of the different forms and we're gonna, we have resources to do so. Some of you may have seen in this past quarter, we worked hard and we were able to raise a million dollars in this last uh, three months of the campaign. And that's despite some serious headwinds. You may have recalled and participated in it. We had a primary in this past quarter. We had to spend some money on that. Uh, so this hasn't necessarily been easy, but we're working hard to make sure we've got the resources to get the word out. Now, uh, I'm not overly concerned about the lies and attacks that are gonna be coming from the other side. That's often all they do have, because we know Stefanik doesn't have a record to run on. She certainly doesn't wanna show up at a debate stage and talk about her record. And so she's gonna rely on, on lies and attacks, but I've got some pretty thick skin. Uh, I'll take those slings and arrows for all of us. And uh, we'll push back when it's appropriate. Certainly when they, when they have lies, we're, we're, I'm not shy about pushing back uh, and holding others accountable uh, when it's warranted. But we're gonna stay focused on remaining on offense and holding Congresswoman Stefanik accountable for her record of failure. Listen, this is a, a good update for folks who aren't aware of something that we've been able to do uniquely in this cycle that prior candidates weren't able to, despite having tried. I know that there was at least one cycle where Tedra Cobb tried to get an independent line on the ballot and wasn't able to withstand a challenge. We collected, with many of your uh, effort and, and help in doing so, uh, a tremendous number of signatures to get a second line on the ballot, called the Moderate Party. We were required by the state to get 3,500 signatures. We turned in 6,600 signatures. And we turned more signatures for the Moderate Party line than we did for the Democratic Party. <laughs> Which I think underscores that there are folks who wanna be a part of a coalition. They wanna come together because we had a lot of independents and Republicans sign that petition. We had Republicans carrying that petition. And that's exciting for us because there are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of folks, we sometimes call them mega Republicans. She, Stefana can have all the MAGA Republicans she wants. We're gonna have the mega Republicans, the make Elise go away Republicans. <laughs> And there are a lot of folks right now that are feeling a sense of political homelessness. And it cuts to both sides. I've talked to some Democrats that don't feel well served by what they're seeing in Washington or maybe even seeing in New York State. And one of the concerns that I've had from the very beginning is just my orientation. I am a moderate. Throughout much of my adult life, I was an independent. I was unaffiliated with a major political party. Um, I am a moderate. I'm somebody that is always gonna seek to just do the right thing that I think speaks to the common sense values that we need to address problems. The challenges that I've seen over the recent years, one of the reasons why I got into this race in addition to January 6th is that the loudest voices in the room right now, the people that are occupying and taking up so much oxygen on our television screens are on the extremes. But the vast majority of us find ourselves in the middle and we don't have a voice anymore. And in this race, we are seeking to reestablish a voice for what I believe is the great moderate, great middle majority. You may be center right, you may be center left, you may be smack dab in the center, but there are, we're, there are more of us in the middle than there are on the extremes. And we have an opportunity in this race through the coalition that we're building and using this vehicle of the moderate party line to create a space for those independents or Republicans that might not be able to bring themselves to vote for a Democrat. They can vote for us there. And we know that that's a good practice that other uh, Democrats, even in uh, New York 21 and in the North Country, have actually utilized to great effect. So we have that as not just a tool to build a coalition, but the messaging around it. And it's not just a coalition to win an election. It's a coalition to govern more effectively. Because the only way we're gonna get anything done in this country is by coming together and actually focusing on the problems and solving them, not the distractions and dividers. <laughs> I, I had two
see you on the whole wallet on MSNBC. I seen you in a couple in a few other places. But then uh, I went to the last thing you had up in Port Edward, and then I was saying to my wife, well, I don't know if he's really out there getting around to different places or whatever. And she said, well, you know, why don't you go on the internet? Magic <laughs> Sally for Congress. I went on there, and you have been all over it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I say to other people here, and to tell other people, get on and take a look at what he's been doing. See what's going on. Thank you for noticing. I appreciate it. <laughs> the 55,000 miles of my truck appreciate you noticing. <laughs> um, yeah, listen, in addition to doing town halls, we're just showing up in every single community and engaging with folks. And it may be in a room full of 100 and however many uh, people we have here today, or it could be you know, two folks in a coffee shop or stopping by uh, you know, a farmer's market and uh, chatting with folks. And one of the exciting things about me, while yes, you may call one person and they may not have heard of me, well, we were in Keene this past weekend and I just showed up. Like I just had stepped into the farmer's market in the, in the Keene Valley and people started to come over to me and they recognized my face and they were so excited to know that I was running. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago when we had the primary, I was cutting across Washington and Warren County. I was stopping off and chatting with some folks at the different polling locations and I stopped into a Stewart's to go get a drink. And I got stopped by a gentleman and he said, hey, good luck today. I'd never seen this person before in my life. He said, good luck today. It was a primary day. He's like, I can't vote for you because I'm a Republican but I'm voting for you in November, and all of my Republican friends are voting for you. They're not just sitting home. They may be concerned with the direction of our district, and they rightfully should be, but they're not just sitting home and not voting for Stefanik. They're coming over and joining our coalition. And it's a tremendous opportunity we have, not just for our district, to show what, it, what we can accomplish when we come together, but I think set a tone for the rest of the nation uh, at, I mean, I, no one needs to, I think, understand more that, than we do that Congresswoman Stefanik has so much advanced her own career that she's now at the number three in House Republican leadership. There's all this buzz about maybe a short list for vice president with Trump in 2024. We have an opportunity for the rest of the nation and a responsibility to send a clear message that we're rejecting the politics of extremism, of division, and actually focusing on coming together for moderates in a coalition that we're building here. So. I'm excited about the hard work that we're doing over the course of the next five weeks um, because I'm going to put another 30,000 miles at least on that truck <laughs> and going into all those communities. Gentlemen, all the way in the back. Oh, no, hang on. Bob, it's okay. Can I go with him first? Okay. You can go next. Oh. Yeah, sure. I love passing it along. This is great. I actually kind of have an offbeat question. Sure. <laughs> it's really more about um, racism, and I, I wrote this out, that's the teacher in me, so I want to know where you would stand, like, do you support removal of Native American mascots from schools? What would you do if you were elected to ensure that they stay or they don't stay? And are you in a position, um, or would you, if in a position, um, would you introduce a bill that halts funding? You hear we're going to stop funding for this, we're going to stop funding for that. And I'm just trying to get a feel for where you stand on this. You know, would you be um, someone who is going to be looking to actually stop funding if schools kind of keep um, going forward with what a lot of people would considering to be racist mascots, names, logos. Um, I do have young children, so just kind of throwing that out there, I'm trying to get a feel for everything. It's a great question. I really appreciate you asking it. Are you, did you mention you are a teacher? I did. Uh, what, do you, what do you teach? I teach accounting. Oh, great. Fantastic. <laughs> um, you're much smarter than I am. Uh, so I think it's an important one. and. I, from my perspective, listen, I'm applying for a job at the federal level. I think these decisions are best made at a local level. And so I don't necessarily know it's the federal government's role or responsibility to be prejudging 
what kinds of things are culturally appropriate and what's not within a community i do think that we need as a matter of course respect for indigenous people and i do think that we should be having a conversation about promoting opportunities to respect indigenous people in our country because for far too long i think that they've maybe not been acknowledged and certainly the atrocities that were you know perpetrated in our country to be able to acknowledge those things as a matter of our history and to talk about that stuff because history should not be something we shy away from history is something that we should embrace and have an honest accounting about nobody has to feel bad about it it's something we should just be able to discuss when it comes to funding levels listen i'm a strong supporter of education and want to make sure that we are providing as much funding as possible to our education system to our schools because they are the lifeblood of our communities they're a place where we gather together it's where we're training the future generations and giving them the kinds of tools that they can be to be good citizens but also help grow our economy and just be good human beings so i want to make sure that we're providing as many resources as possible i'm not sure i would put preconditions on what kinds of resources should or should not be made based upon local determinations that are being made in a local community so in response to that specific example i'm not sure that i would as a federal legislator say because i don't know if it exists and i don't necessarily also know whether we should be creating boogeymen to then that would ultimately hurt our local communities and our kids by attaching some perception of a boogeyman that would preclude access to federal funds to help our education system I'll maybe comment a little bit on the, the latter point of this question around scams. And maybe folks here have received phone calls or gotten an email or click on this, whatever it may be. I certainly get um, my, my own parents uh, are targets of, of these things, and I have to advise my father, do not click on that, don't, don't open that thing, whatever it may be. Um, but it's a real problem, and it's one that is targeting intentionally our seniors. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Senator Gillibrand introduced and has tried to put forward some sort of legislation to make sure that we're uh, going after this problem. But it's certainly one that needs to be addressed in, in, in equipping, I think, our law enforcement, uh, who are already overworked and undermanned, uh, with the tools necessary to helpfully go after some of these folks to preclude them from taking such action. And then to go make sure that we're getting whatever funds may be acquire from some of these entities that exist out there but it's a real problem and it's one that i'm not as at least familiar with where the ultimate sources are 
where are they coming from? Are they coming from outside of the country? Because now you're talking about who the different entities need to be tasked with this. You know, is it the FBI? Is it some federal entity? Is it some folks within our own communities who are gaining access to some stuff? Um, so I think it's one that requires certainly a better understanding and a prioritization from a law enforcement perspective to make sure that we're helping to protect our community, the people that we love and we care about, from being subjects uh, of, of these scams that are depriving folks of real money and depriving them, you know, you know, secure access to their devices, whatever it may be. Um, so it's, it's a real thing that I want to make sure is a top priority. The other question you had was around workforce and shortages that everyone is having right now. We can't find workers. Let me also right up front dispel this notion. People are not being paid to stay home right now. That is not a thing. You'll hear that from the other side that somehow people, nobody wants to work. They're getting paid to stay home. That ended uh, many months ago, if not a year ago, with some of the COVID relief that came when folks couldn't work because of COVID. Um, right now, we actually just have a challenge because we're seeing some major shifts in our economy. We have a lot of folks who are retiring and deciding to take the advantage of the opportunity to leave the workforce. We have other folks and you know new jobs that are popping up and we can't really find the right number of folks to work there. And in our community, we don't have a lot of folks who are staying here. Many of you are probably parents or grandparents and have seen your kids or your grandkids leave the area because they didn't have the kinds of opportunities that they wanted for their future. We haven't made the investments that are necessary in our community to create a community that can thrive, to create a place where our kids want to stay, want to work, want to raise a family. That's been going on at least for the last eight years that Congresswoman Stefanik has been representing our district. She hasn't made investments in our future. She's only made investments in her future. And so we need somebody that's actually, I think, going to focus on creating the space um, and making those kinds of investments that are useful to creating a community that can thrive. And, I take a little bit of a different approach in terms of economic development than many of you maybe have heard or have been a part of at a local level. Sometimes at a local level, local economic development is like, well, let's just create one tax incentive and we'll get that employer to attract them here and then they can create jobs. But all it takes is for the economics not to work for that employer and they leave and they leave a the community devastated. So how can we create resiliency within our community? That's making investments in education. That's making investments in healthcare that's making investments in human and social services. It's making investments in, I think, the DRI program that we see from the state is a great opportunity to create community spaces to gather and enjoy you know, being with one another. When we make investments in our community, certainly too with infrastructure and broadband and all the critical components we need to thrive in you know, the 21st century, when we make those kinds of investments, we now at least have the building blocks by which to grow an economy to create opportunity and believe you, when we attract and retain talent, employers will come, jobs will come. So if we flip it on its head and start making the actual investments that can help our communities grow, then we'll grow our economy as well. I have one question that I can uh, answer right now because I've been told that, but don't be uh, shy. Afterwards, I'm gonna be here for at least 10 minutes and you come up and, and chat with me directly. <laughs> Can, can I take the gentleman all the way in the back? Because we almost had an opportunity for him. He gave it to somebody else, but I want to make sure you get it. Um, my question is kind of uh, a comment from that question. Um, you know, we're talking about the fourth in the person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, the cost of becoming too disciplined and being alone in that regard. But my, my question really is uh, about uh, the dovetail off the phone banking and say you do. Um, and but it really speaks to uh, the civil rights of, of women here in this in this region with regards to abortion. Um, and really as a, I see it as an opportunity, even though we are uh, you know a very blue state and it is certainly in our constitution we benefit from that. But I, I feel it's also an opportunity for broadening your coalition young women, uh, young families, because we have entirely too much skin in the game with regards to this community. Um, and, and that abortion debate, every father, mother that has a daughter, is certainly, uh, can, can, that resonates with them. And I, I have two daughters, um, love them dearly, but I also want them to have the full rights they're entitled to as, a, as an American. I want to know where you stand in that. 
special that which is I got your rate, I apologize. Yeah. Um, where you stand on an issue and whether or not your campaign sees that as an opportunity to speak to young women, young families. Thank you. Good is uh, before we touched on it, but I didn't have the opportunity to dive into it a little bit deeper, so thank you for presenting that. And I do I don't want to sound cynical and phrase it as an opportunity. It's a necessity. Because right now, certainly in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision, millions of American women are currently under threat across this nation because they don't have uh, control over their own bodies and their own health care decisions. That's a serious challenge that can only be addressed at the federal level. It requires, and this is something some folks have asked me a question, what's the first thing I want to work on when I'm in Congress? Day one, codifying a woman's right to choose in federal law and doing it at the federal level. And this is not just a threat that materialized in the aftermath of Dobbs. It's now taken a step further. Many people saw on the news Lindsey Graham put forward this national abortion ban. You may not have seen that days later, Congresswoman Stefanik became the highest ranking Republican in the House of Representatives to co-sponsor the same legislation and pledge that she was gonna push forward this national abortion ban should Republicans get a majority in the House. That national abortion ban is a blue state ban. So while we consider and talk about, well, you know, here in New York, we've got certain protections, nah, -uh. not if they come forward with that. And so there's a real fight on our hands right now in this election to make sure that we are preventing not just that from happening, but going even a step further and protecting a woman's right to have uh, control of her own body and make her own healthcare decisions, because that's what it's about. It's about choice. It's about having control of themselves. And it is a family issue. It's about families coming together and determining how and when they want to start a family. That choice should be theirs. There is no role for the government to be had there. It is severe government overreach. And so yes, I hope folks understand we will continue to spread the word uh, throughout the course of the next five weeks in our campaign, but I'd ask all of you to continue to also spread that word about the importance of this election. There are many reasons why this election is one of the most important of our lifetime, if not the most important of our lifetime. It seems that every election gets to that stage. But not only is democracy on the line, but freedom is on the line. And there's a real threat now from extremists like Congresswoman Stefanik who are cynical. They would sell any one of us out to advance their own career. That's her pattern of behavior. That's what she's done time and time again. And you can count on her to continue to do so. And it's time to stand up and show her that we want something different. We're on the wrong track. Her vision of the future is a terrible one that would ruin our district and potentially ruin our country. And we have a tremendous opportunity to speak with one voice, a unified voice, across party lines, to stand up and say, no, we're gonna to come together. We're actually gonna start solving some problems. We're gonna respect the freedom and dignity of all people. And we're not gonna allow this to stand. Thank you everybody for the opportunity to be with you. Five more weeks. Five more weeks.